Hello, everyone. Thanks very much for attending this Nature Masterclass in how to write a great paper. Um, welcome. We hope you got online okay. My name is Jack Leamy. I'm one of the editors here at Nature Careers. And in just a moment, I'm going to introduce Christine, who's going to talk us through the rest of this talk. Um, this is just a couple of quick housekeeping things just to make sure that you interact with this event properly. Um, first of all, we have a question box that should be coming up. Um, uh, but it should be on your screens now, just below this video. Uh, if you do have any questions that occur to you throughout the talk, please do ask them in that box and we'll get to as many questions as possible once, uh, once this goes live. Uh, we will also have a couple of polls that will come up throughout the course of this session. Um, so if you do have any, uh, so when that does sort of pop up on your screens, please do vote in them and we'll be discussing them, uh, Christine and I, in just a moment. Other than that, I think we should be all good to go. So I'm now going to hand over to Christine Hoyers, who will be able to talk um, about how to make a great paper. Thank you very much, Christine. Thank you very much, Jack. Um, I'm indeed very excited uh, to virtually be here today at this Nature Careers live event in this rather difficult year uh, 2020. As Jack mentioned, my name is Christine. I'm a senior editor um, on the Nature Re Reviews Materials team. I've actually just came back to the team after having been at Nature Nanotechnology uh, for about a year, where I handled manuscripts in the areas of biomaterials, nanomedicine, drug delivery, really everything related to biology in the nanotech material science space. I'm originally from the beautiful city of Vienna in Austria, but now I've been uh, with uh, Springer Nature already for more than three years. And the talk I'm going to give today is really a bit of a shorter version of what we usually teach at Nature Masterclasses. I don't know if any of you have heard of this um, yet, uh, but Nature Masterclasses are delivered by Nature Research Editors. And we talk about scientific writing, publishing, the editorial process, peer review, all of the things. And we used to do them in person, traveling all over the world. For obvious reasons, we can't do this now, but we do them online. So if any of you are interested in this, please have a look. All right, so today I'm going to talk about what makes a great paper. So while I'm sure that there are many answers to this question, I want to give you today a bit of an editorial perspective on it. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about what sort of papers we publish at the different nature journals, what we're looking for, how we as editors assess manuscripts when we get them, what are the uh, criteria we apply. And then I'm also going to give you some scientific writing tips and tricks that you can use um, uh, to write a first class research paper that you then hopefully at some point can submit to one of our journals and publish with us. So I want to start with uh, um, Nature's mission statement. So Nature has celebrated its 150th birthday last year. And the mission really remains the same since the beginning, and that is to place before the general public the result of scientific discovery and to help scientists to learn about advances in all branches of natural knowledge. And I think we, we all can now, probably more than ever, appreciate the importance um, for, for scientists and researchers to clearly and effectively communicate their science so that not only your immediate peers in your immediate fields can understand what you've been doing, but also researchers in other discipline and the general public. So nature itself publishes really um, uh, papers that report important advances with really wide implications. And this importance should be apparent to researchers in other fields and also to non-specialists. So I think we can all agree that, for example, the structure of the DNA um, was such an advance uh, that is not only relevant to biology, but really relevant to all of us. Similarly, to give you a more recent example, the structure of the spike protein of the coronavirus that is just uh, um, is important and obvious, obviously important to all of us. And for example, um, to not only talk about biology, 
Nature also published the discovery of an exoplanet. And I have really no idea about astrophysics whatsoever, but I certainly know that this was a huge thing and for our understanding of the universe. So these are these kind of papers that, that Nature is publishing, papers that address one of the key problems in, in the field, one of the key problems in science. The Nature Research Journals um, do essentially the same thing, however, within their distinct area. For example, in material science for nature materials or in nanotechnology, for example, in nature nanotechnology, which uh, is the journal that I was working on. So this should also be, this should also be papers that report really key advances, but in this respective field. So as many of you may know, um, there are several journals in the nature research portfolio. For example, our flagship open access journal, Nature Communications, or the other communications journals, biology, chemistry, physics, recently joined by communications, earth and environment, and of course, scientific reports. And if you would want to think of these different journals in sort of a pyramid sort of structure in terms of selectivity and exposure, nature and the nature research journals would be on top of this pyramid. So they are very, very selective. However, you also get a lot of exposure. So many people will read your paper. And there is also quite a bit of editorial input, really, from the very beginning of manuscript submission to the actual publication. So what does make a great paper? The rather simple answer is great research. You cannot turn crappy research into a great paper. So what do I mean with great research? I know it's easy for me to say I'm the editor. I'm not the one doing the research. But I mean great data, strong evidence, robust data that allows you to draw noteworthy conclusions. Therefore, a great paper really starts long before you actually write a manuscript. It starts when you conceive your project, probably when you write your grant, when you formulate your hypothesis, when you think about a research question that you would like to address. But also when you start designing your experiments, your experimental setup, when you probably think about your controls, your animal model, the cell line you want to use. And then when you analyze the way you analyze your data, are you, if you apply the appropriate statistics, if you use the right analysis tools. So all of these things really build the foundation of a great research paper. So once you have all of these things and you have your great research in hand, you need to write it up. Um, you need to write it up. And um, that means you need to write a manuscript. And this can be a difficult task if you have worked for many, many years on your research project. And it's important before you start writing that you take a step back and think about the story you want to tell. Think about what is the main, the key finding I have here? What are the key conclusions? And also, who am I writing it for? You, you want, uh, hopefully, many people to read your work. So you need to think about your audience. Let me give you an example from my field in biomaterials. We are very often at the crossroads between biology and medicine and, and the physical sciences, material science. So, for example, if you have a paper that has a lot of biology in it, but you want to submit it to Nature Materials, keep in mind that you need to introduce your work. You in, need to introduce the biology in a way that a material scientist can follow without having to look up 15 different textbooks. So it's important when you write your manuscript that you tell a story and then you, that you write it in a clear way so that people can understand it. Then you can submit it and then hopefully only after a few rounds of revisions, um, you can um, eventually publish it. And then you, you yourself and other researchers can build on this research and drive the field forward. So I want now uh, that you guys uh, step in the shoes of an editor and think about what kind of criteria you would assess, you, you would use when you assess a research paper. So we editors, the first thing we do every morning is we look at our inbox and look at all the manuscripts that have been submitted to us. And then we read every manuscript from the beginning to the very end. And then we have certain editorial criteria in our head that we will apply to decide whether we're going to send it out for peer review or not. And we're going to prioritize those criteria. And now, um, Jack, do you want to um, start the poll? Absolutely. Please. I'm going to 
click go on that poll. So I'm going to ask you guys now. now have... After you, Christine, I do apologize. No, no worries at all. Thanks, thanks for launching the poll. So um, there are a few options now for you guys, and I want you to think about what would be the most important thing for you if you were the editor that you would consider when assessing the paper. Is it that it's directly relevant to the scope of the journal? Robust data sets that support the main conclusion, well-written well text and clearly presented layout, that it's engaging and well thought out figures, um, and that it describes a new or surprising finding. Okay, I'm gonna gather the poll results, Christine. So I'm just gonna click on continue here and have a look. So it looks like the largest results are, uh, are directly relevant to the scope of the journal, around a third of people. Um, with around 30% is robust data sets that support the main conclusion uh, and then sort of decreasing in share. Describes a new or surprising finding at around 20%. A well-written text that's clearly presented layout is around 13%. And finally, with a relatively tiny 2% engaging and well thought out figures. All right. Thank you very much, Jack. Well, that's very interesting. And... And that's certainly, first of all, all of the things are important and all of the things are on, on an editor's mind when reading a paper. And I agree, uh, I agree with you all that it needs to be in the scope of the journal, of course. That may be not as relevant for nature because pretty much everything is in the scope of nature. But I had papers on my desk at Nature Nanotechnology that I, that I thought were amazing. However, they were just not nanotechnology. The exciting things were all happening at the, at the macro scale, for example. Uh, the robust data sets, of course, are the foundation of a paper, and um, we also heavily rely, of course, on peer reviewers to help us um, with, uh, with uh, judging that. A, a well-written text is important because if it's not clear what the authors have done or, or, or what the research is about, it's very hard to assess. Describes a new surprising finding that are obviously every editor's most favorite papers. So if I read an abstract and I go like, wow, I've never heard of this or, oh, wow, I know this has been an issue in the field for such a long time and the authors clearly can address this now. Um, this is an important point. Uh, regarding the figures, um, figures are the backbone of every paper. This is how you present your results. Having said that, they need to be accurate, but this is something that can be worked on. If, if they're correct, this is something that can be worked on. So, so it's pretty spot on, guys. Very nice. So um, what do nature editors look for? Mainly breadth of interest. The novel conclusions need to be relevant to scientists in other fields. I gave you guys a few examples at the beginning, for example, the structure of the DNA, exoplanets, CRISPR-Cas9, things that we all know are important beyond your immediate field. Um, but also it needs to be a striking conceptual advance. That is that the novel conclusions that you can draw need to change our understanding of the field. It needs to be something that moves the field forward. So if it's, for example, just if you just have uh, applied a technique to confirm or replicate something that is known, that's certainly worthwhile publishing important important uh, data. However, it may not be a nature paper. Similarly, if it's very much in line with expectations or if it's, for example, a very specialized method that is also certainly important to publish and is a, will be relevant for your uh, people in your field, however, maybe a method that nobody else could use outside. This may also not be necessarily a nature paper. But also it's important to have strong logical support for your conclusions. It could also be a mechanistic insight. I mentioned a bit of structural biology at the beginning. This is certainly also something that nature would be interested in. And importantly, um, the work should inspire future research. It should not end there. It should not end with the paper. It should start with the paper. The paper should be the beginning of hopefully many, many more experiments. Um, I want to give you guys an example of one of the papers I have handled and published um, at Nature Nanotechnology. And this is a beautiful paper by Sangeeta Patia 
uh, that's entitled Engineering Synthetic Breath Biomarkers for Respiratory Disease. So I remember that paper when I had it first in my inbox and I got quite excited already because what the authors did here, they used a very creative nanotechnology solution to analyze disease markers in the breath of patients with respiratory disease. And they could also monitor uh, drug response using this method. So why I uh, pick this example? Because it's certainly in the scope of, of Nature Nano because it's a nanotechnology application. The sensors the authors have developed could certainly be used um, and will hopefully be used for other um, analytes and for other um, diseases. And they addressed something that is very tricky to do. Analyzing markers in breath is, is difficult because of all the molecule mass you have in your breath. So to do this in a sensitive way is very difficult. And in addition, it's interesting for the clinic. They are using it um, uh, for the diagnosis and, and uh, disease monitoring of a disease that is not only unfortunately right now affecting many people, but in general affecting a lot of people. So it will be relevant in the clinic as well. So I think this is a very nice example of, of the points I mentioned before, that it, it's, it's interesting it, for nature nanotechnology, this is relevant for nanotechnologists and beyond. Um, so I wanted to give you this example. So now I want to talk a little bit more about the actual scientific writing, about the writing of a manuscript. And I said that um, um, at the beginning of the talk that you, when you write a paper, you want to create a story. So um, often it is quite good once you, you have your data together, it makes a lot of sense to take a step back and before you actually start writing, think about what, what, uh, which story you want to tell. How to uh, uh, create a narrative throughout the text. And again, if you want to submit it to, to the top tier journals, you need to make, it needs to be of broad interest. Um, so every paper um, starts with the introduction. And um, in the introduction, you should really um, convince the reader why the reader should care. What do I mean? You need to put, you need to first set the stage. That means you put your, um, you need to put your paper in the context. You need to cite the relevant literature. It's not a PhD thesis, so don't cite everything. Pick the most important papers that are relevant to your work. Um, identify the problem in the field and then lead the reader to the objective why you've been doing what you've been doing. Um, the next part is then the results section. This is where you can show the evidence, the strong evidence for your conclusions. In the results section, you most likely will have all your figures that you beautifully cite in the correct order um, and where you describe your data. However, even there, you want to write a narrative. You don't just want to dump your data there. You want to uh, create a narrative. You want to explain your data. And very often, the order here may, might be quite different from the, from the order you conducted your experiments in the first place. And it may make more sense to describe it in a different way, in a different order in the paper, um, where it's in a more logical um, order. And then um, you have your discussion part. In the discussion, you need to put your results in a context. You need to discuss them. You need to convince the reader why the reader should believe you. Um, what I mean is, for example, if you've applied three different techniques to show um, one result, this is the, the, the place where you can discuss it and say, look, we have done all of these different things, which leads us, uh, which lead us to the same conclusion. Again, you can cite now papers that support your data or maybe contradict your data and you can discuss it here and in the end you want to have a little paragraph not necessarily a summary but a paragraph that gives an outlook to the field about what you got to do next about your future work but also where you think this work or other fields where you think the work could be relevant for and I'm going to now spend um, a few slides on titles and abstracts. The title is really the most important sentence in your paper, because 
we all know we there are so many papers published and we all have our ways of of finding scientific literature uh, and the first thing we always read is the title being it on pubmed being it on google so the title is important so that people know what your paper is about and what your main result is if people read the title and they like it they uh, probably will also read the abstract then so you need to really know your target audience. Um, this is nicely here depicted with the penguins. <laughs> it, so the title, your target audience for your title is big. You want to reach as many readers as you can with your title. And I'm going to give a few examples on the next slide, how you can make your titles accessible to a broad audience. So you want to reach a lot of people with your title. And then if people like the title, they will read the abstract. So it's also very important to put your main findings, your main conclusions in the abstract as well. And then uh, probably if your readers will read the entire paper, this may probably be the people who are more in your field, the more specialist audience who are interested in more of the technical details. Having said that, um, these readers most likely will find your paper anyways because they know the field, they know what they're looking for, they will read your paper. What you want to target is a broad audience with your title and with your abstract. At Nature, we talk about this as the A, B, C of writing, of writing style, accurate, brief, and clear. Um, so what do I mean with that? Accurate means you need to be um, uh, you don't want to have any fluffy messages. Um, this is a scientific paper. It's not like fiction. So you want to be correct and precise. Um, brief, everybody is very busy. There's so many paper, papers published um, uh, nowadays. So you want to be brief. You want to be to the point and to keep attention of the reader. And importantly, you want to be clear. Avoid ambiguity. I had uh, lots of manuscripts um, on my desk where after reading halfway through the manuscripts, I still didn't really understand what the, what the uh, author, author, author have actually done. And it's very tricky to analyze. So what was the animal model? What did you do? So it's very important to be very clear in your manuscript. And for the title, there is also a D, E, and F. Declarative, engaging, and focused. Declarative um, um, means that you want to be clear. The key finding, the key result needs to be clear, and it should be in the title. So if you, have, if you see an effect, don't just state that there is an effect. State the nature of the effect, what the effect, effect is about. Engaging um, means you don't want to be too technical. You don't want to have like technical terms or in your title that nobody outside of your field knows. And you don't want to have people to look up a having to look up a scientific dictionary to understand your title. So you want to be engaging and focused means it should be clear which area you're working in. So declarative, engaging, focus, these are the things you, you want to keep in mind when you write your title. Of course, this is the, the balance is sometimes really tricky. And I can tell you that I spend quite a lot of time when editing manuscripts and especially when editing reviews now. I spend quite a lot of time on the title and I often go back and forth with the author several times to really identify the correct title that has the keywords in it so that uh, as many readers as possible will find it. Um, so how can you do that? Um, first, avoid complex compound nouns. So don't string many, many nouns together. I'm a German native speaker and we tend to create, make very, very, very long words that nobody understands. You don't have to do this in the English language, which is great. Uh, one of the ways to avoid this is to use active voice rather than uh, passive voice. Passive voice always needs many more words. So this is sometimes a fairly easy way of avoiding this. Um, Please also do avoid acronyms and jargon. Um, acronyms, um, you, you're probably going to get away. You will get away with DNA. You're going to get away with CRISPR, especially now after it has been awarded the Nobel Prize um, in chemistry. But if it's an acronym that is not known outside your field, and it may even mean something else in different field, it's better not to have it in the title. Um, it's also good to not to be too assertive 
in your title, for example, if you manage to kill cancer cells in a dish, that is fantastic, but you may not write them that you can cure cancer in your title. Um, also, we always tell authors to please avoid questions in the title, because um, if you have the answer to this question in your manuscript, better to write down the answer right away. Um, also avoid puns. They may be funny or good in like a front half article, in like a news and views or in a comment, but certainly not in a for a scientific paper. And also, um, it's good to not be too specific. So if your transcription factor is called XYZ 50,503, uh, you may not want to have this in the title, but just write um, a distinct transcription factor, for example. So let's put this a little bit into practice. I'm going to read an abstract on the following slide for you guys. And I want you to think about a, a title for the corresponding paper. Of course, you only have the abstract and not the entire paper, but it should be, it should be uh, possible. And when you think about the title, I want you to keep in mind that the main result or results of, your wor of the work should be in the title. It still should be engaging and should be accurate and always use simple uh, language. So um, the abstract is, Driven by technological progress, human life expectancy has increased greatly since the 19th century. Demographic evidence has revealed an ongoing reduction in old age mortality and a rise of the maximum age at death, which may gradually extend human longevity. Together with observations that lifespan in various animal species is flexible and can be increased by genetic or pharmaceutical intervention, these results have led to suggestions that longevity may not be subject to strict species-specific genetic constraints. Here, by analyzing global demographic data, we show that improvements in survival with age tend to decline after age 100, and that the age at death of the world's oldest person has not increased since the 1990s. Our results strongly suggest that the maximum lifespan of humans is fixed and subject to natural constraints. So this is the abstract, quite intriguing results here. And I have a few titles now. Um, uh, and it would be great, Jack, if we could start the poll and see which title our Absolutely. audience likes best. Thank you. Let me just kick that off. Um, launching that poll right now okay uh, and everyone should have a little box on their screens to select what they prefer great so title a is analysis of global demographic data reveals that improvements in human survival with age decline after age 100 and the maximum human lifespan is fixed title b improvements in human survival with age decline after age 100 Title C, human lifespan and longevity. Title D, is there an evidence for a limit to human lifespan? And title E, human lifespan is not limitless. Thanks very much. Uh, let me gather the results to those. Thank you. And talk you through them. So by far, the most popular title is title B, that's improvements in human survival with age decline after age 100, um, with 52% of the vote. Um, around a fifth of the vote goes to title E, human lifespan is not limitless. And then we peter out a little bit. Um, in order, it's title C, and then title A and title D are tied for last place with around 6.5% each. Great. Thanks helpful. a lot, Jack. Yeah, thank you. Okay, that's interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say it. None of the titles, titles is the published title. A, a little bit sneaky here, but it's interesting. I, um, title B is, is indeed a good title. I like it. However, the one thing I would probably criticize about it is that it's not necessarily stating the main, the key finding of the paper. Um, title E human lifespan is not limitless is probably a bit closer because that's actually sort of the key 
or one of the key results, sort of. I'm glad you guys were not so much uh, in favor of Title A and D. Title A is, is very long. It reads, to me, it reads a bit more like a like an editorial summary rather than a title. And Title D is a question. So if I would read this, I would ask right away, so so is there evidence? Have you found evidence? And Title C is 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 would be, I think, quite a nice title for a review article, maybe, that generally discusses uh, human lifespan. Um, so I mentioned that there is... Uh, None of the titles were the actual published titles. If you guys have any good title that you would want to share with me, any better suggestions than the one uh, than the examples we had here, I'm happy to to discuss it. Absolutely. Um, if anyone has uh, improved titles, please do put them in the question box, and I'll try to read them out as quickly as possible. In the meantime, while we're waiting, I have a question for you, Christine, if that's all right. Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, I'd just like to ask you about that active versus passive tense. Could you give an example of that? Um, and just tell me a little bit more about, about what you mean by a active versus passive tense. Um, so especially for the title, I mean, the, there is a bit of debate right, whether what, what's better. I mean, the, the main reason why I've been saying that is because the passive tense, the passive voice needs so many more words usually. You will in, in you always need to use more words when you say it in the passive words. Where, whereas when you say it active, A triggers B, or um, this protein promotes um, this pathway, you can just say it in an active voice rather than saying the pathway is promoted by this protein. Um, is really, I think it's it's usually more catchy, and again, it just uses less words. And readers are, I mean, we we all know that we all have so many, so many paper. I mean, as editors, anyways, but everybody, there is so many papers to read, so much literature published. Um, attention span is short, of course. Everybody's busy, so it's always good to just have a snappy, short, correct title. Um, and the passive voice is just. Um, not as as catchy and again just uses usually too many words right um okay but but essentially it's all about having something do something right in, a, in yes. an active voice yes. just to explain what that is it right so it's it yeah okay um cool well we've got loads of answers in um for oh, suggested nice. titles thanks so much for everyone for writing in um i'm going to read a couple out um Someone mm -hmm. here from uh, from Budapest says the constrained nature of the human lifespan. What do you think about that? Nice, nice. That is yeah, that nice. is that okay. is actually a really nice title. Um, yeah, I like it. Great. Uh, human longevity is not limitless from a genetic manipulation. I think that's. Um, uh, we've also got role of genetic factors. I'm sorry, gone. I think that is uh, sorry, Jack. Um, that is. I think that's a very uh, that's a very nice uh, title. I think it's a bit long. Um, it's it's correct. Um, it's not. I'm I'm not entirely sure is it from the abstract if that's really what they could rule out in the end. Um, uh, the role of genetics. The abstract suggest suggested that's that's true, but I think it it could be a bit shorter. But it's a good title. Okay, great. I'm gonna I'm gonna do six or seven in rapid fire right so effects of technology on human life expectancy i've got here um demographic data suggests that the human lifespan is not limitless um the role of technology in human lifespan uh discovery of a limitation to the increase of lifespan um this one's interesting the study into the reasons behind an increased longevity of the humans uh, which is kind of an interesting one um and finally, one last one, human lifespan is limited to 100 years. What are your thoughts? Okay. Th thanks a lot. It's amazing. I mean, I think there were quite a few interesting titles in there. And it just tells you how tricky it is and how many different titles you could do for one abstract. And we haven't even read the, the paper yet. 
Um, many of them were, were good, to be honest. Some of them may be a bit long, um, but sometimes that's also taste if you want to put a bit more information in. I'm going to give you guys now the, the actual published title, which was Evidence for a Limit to Human Lifespan. I think it ticks all the boxes, is is uh, declarative, it's engaging, it's focused. You can imagine that it's been picked up by the media <laughs> nicely and that lots of people um, read it. But to be honest, you guys had a few really good suggestions. And I think, as I said, this just shows us that it's there are many options for writing a title. And it's good to, uh, when, you, when, you, when you guys write your own papers, and then in the end, you you decide on the title that you maybe talk to a few um, colleagues and see what everybody thinks and 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 do a bit of brainstorming for this. Thank you all so much for for participating. That's great. Um, I'm going to move on now from the titles um, and talk a bit about abstracts. Um, I mentioned that the title is for sure the most important sentence um, in in your paper, but then that's followed by the abstract. So if people scroll through, if readers scroll through um, different papers and then they find a title that they think, oh, that sounds interesting, the next thing they're gonna read is the abstract. And at Nature, we have um, an abstract, so, the so-called Nature Abstract Formula that I'm gonna share with you guys now that you hopefully um, can use then for your own uh, manuscripts. And in, in this abstract formula, um, the idea is that you first, spend one one sentence on setting the stage. That is, you introduce your field. And this first sentence shown here in red should really be understandable to people outside of your field. So if I read an astrophysics paper, I will understand nothing, but I should understand the very first sentence. So that's a bit the idea. And then you have, you can spend one or two sentences shown here still in red, where you give a bit more detailed background. So first you introduce your field and then you give a bit more detail in which area of this field, in which subdiscipline are you working on or which kind of problem are you addressing on? Once you have that, you can then show here, shown here in green, um, spend one or two sentences introducing the general problem the issue you're addressing, the problem that's in the field. Um, uh, usually it starts with however. So um, you can nicely start it with however. You say, this is the field. This is what I'm working on. This is what people are interested in. However, nobody knows the mechanism. However, we cannot cure the disease. Um, so that I as a reader understand now, okay, this is the problem you're working on. And then you want to spend one or two sentences summarizing the main result. Um, and it's important that your key result really is in the abstract. I'm, I'm reading, quite, I read quite a lot of abstracts in my manuscripts where people spend many, many sentences of the, of the abstract introducing lots of things. All of the things can go into the introduction where you can then spend more detailed discussion, um, where you can discuss it in more detail, but the key results should be in your abstract. And then shown in orange, um, you, you have a few sentences where you put the thing in broader context. You say, what, what do my results mean? And what, is, what, what could be the future work or who else could pick it up? Um, so this is the general uh, nature abstract formula. And um, I would want to apply it now to an actual abstract so that you can see, um, can see a bit better what I mean. Um, so in this abstract, we have now the same color code as we had before and shown in red is the introduction to the field that I mentioned. During cell division, mitotic spindles are assembled by microtubule based motor proteins. So me as a reader, not being a biologist, but I understand, okay, clearly these authors or these researchers work on cell division. They're interested in the role uh, of, of motor proteins in, in spindle division and uh, spindle assembly. So then they spend two sentences talking a bit more about the details, which kind of motor proteins, in this case it's a specific one, they're working on. And they say there is a hypothesis out there that this and this, this could be the mechanism for these proteins, how these proteins work. And then they introduce the problem shown in green. However, the precise role of this uh, protein um, uh, are unknown. The precise roles are unknown. 
okay, I understand the mechanism is not known. The exact mechanism is not known. So now we know the field and we know what the problem is. And this is just a few sentences. And then the authors go into detail of what they have done now in this paper. Here we show our results demonstrate. These are the typical phrases that you can use in your abstract um, to um, um, present your key results. So in this purple bit here, this is where your key results should be discussed. And then shown in orange, um, we anticipate um, that uh, our essay, we anticipate our essay to be a starting point. So then um, they explain this is what our results mean. They could be used for other things now. And furthermore, they're also a target of an anti-cancer drug. So you put it in a broader context. You say, we've done of the basic mechanism, but that may also be of interest for clinical research or preclinical research. So I think that's a, it's a nice example of how you can apply this abstract formula to your abstract. And you can really try it with your, with the abstract. If you're writing a paper right now for your, for papers you write in the future, you'll see if you use this little keywords, like, however, here we show our results demonstrate. And if you try to apply this formula, the abstract is going to become hopefully accessible to many readers. So with this, I'm actually going to um, uh, wrap up here um, uh, and, and, and summarize a little bit the talk. So um, there is really no secret formula or any backdoor that guarantees publication in a top journal. It is really about the science and the research. The research question needs to be important for many, for many fields, not just for your immediate field. The data needs to be robust and, and the findings need to be of, of relevance. And of course, the way the paper is written plays a role. Having said that, I would never, no, no editor would ever reject the paper just because it's not, the English is not, not good or anything like that. Absolutely not. It's about telling a story and it needs to be written in a clear way. And it can be very simple, actually it should be rather simple language so that people can understand it. Avoid any empty statements. I do a lot of editing of reviews and, and very often I cut out, I remove lots of sentences where I just say there's actually that the sentence doesn't say something. Um, it's make sure that every sentence has like a scientific meaning. And for your next manuscripts, consider applying the nature formula for your abstract and um, um, keep in mind what we talked about titles. Um, I promise you that this will make your, your paper um, much more accessible to a wider audience, which is at the end of the day, the goal if you publish your research, you want people to read it. Um, and with that, I'm gonna um, uh, stop here. Just want to let you know that the master classes I mentioned at the beginning. Um, so this was the, uh, in, in the master classes, we would talk about similar things, but in much more detail, much more interactive, uh, many more exercises. Um, so maybe have a look um, at the website. There's also like two, one new class just launched and one will launch in November. It's about uh, managing research data. I think every scientist, um, I remember with horror of all the massive amount of data we had to analyze. So there is a, there is a course in that, that you may be interested in and also narrative tools for researchers, um, which I think is, is quite interesting. So thank you all very much for sticking with me, for joining today. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. So uh, hit me with every question, with any question you have for an editor. Thank you so yeah. much. Thanks, Christine, so much for that superb talk. I think I speak for everyone watching. Uh, I say thank you for putting that together and for, and for delivering it to us. We got lots of lovely feedback um, as you were talking. Um, uh, something a lot of people asked is whether or not we, we have a presentation available kind of after this event, so people could go back on it. The answer to that is yes, this presentation will be available um, in the future through, I think, this link, or at least a similar one. If, you, if, you, if you're watching this, that means you registered, which means the email address you use to register will get a link um, to the presentation once it's recorded and published. Um, we've now got sort of 20 minutes for questions, um, and loads has already come out, come in along with lots of very, very nice feedback. So thank you very much. Please do continue asking your questions. I'm going to kick us off um, with almost a philosophical one, Christine, if you don't mind. Um, earlier on in that talk, you have that lovely slide of all the penguins. 
um, which was, <laughs> you know, like you want lots and lots of people to see it, to understand your title, and then you want some people to understand your abstract, and then we want you want a smaller sort of select group to understand the main paper. My question is, is why? Um, if you're only looking to target a small group of people to read the whole paper, why do you care about reaching a larger group, larger group with a, a more inclusive title? Why does that matter? Thank you. So th thanks a lot for the question. That's a very good question, actually. Um, I think it matters if you, I think it matters because you want, um, you want people to understand your science and to build on what you've been doing. Let me give you an example. If, for example, um, a nanotechnologist works on this amazing biosensor that I was just been mentioning in the paper, in the Nature Nanotech paper, and develops all of the chemistry and all of the complicated sensing mechanism. And then the paper would be only read by other nanotechnologists who also do work on a similar chemistry and um, know this place, uh, know this sort of work quite well. Nobody would, no clinician, would ever probably click on your title if the title says this click chemistry enables a nanosensing platform. Um, if you would want clinicians to pick it up, for example, um, and read, oh, look, there are nanotechnologists who are developing new biomarkers that we could eventually use or could include in a future preclinical study um, that address a problem that we have been working on. Um, and if, if, if you want these people to read your paper or to pick it up or know even about your research, you need to write a title that doesn't pull them off right away. Um, and very often there is quite a... Uh, quite a gap between, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm using this example because I think it's so important right now, quite a gap between medical research and fundamental science, especially physical sciences, so that that very often if the title is pulling off, it's too much chemistry in the abstract, they go like, oh, no, I'm not, not going to understand this anyways, or vice versa. Um, uh, another example, I've been, I've been handling quite a few manuscripts in the field of immunoengineering, especially for vaccines now, uh, where material scientists put a lot of effort in developing nanoparticles or delivery vehicles for vaccines and antigens. And um, if they write a title or, or an abstract in a way that an immunologist has no idea what it is about, um, they will never read it. They will never know that you've actually done or made this beautiful nanoparticle that can help. And the other way around, I mean, I don't know if how many of you are immunologists, but if I open a, an immunology paper, sometimes I go, like, okay, I'm just, I'm too stupid for this. I won't understand that. So um, I think if the title is written in a way that doesn't pull you off from the beginning, you're more likely to read the abstract. And if you read the abstract, you know about the field. And then in your next collaboration meeting and somebody says, you know what, this is great messenger RNA. I have no idea how to deliver that. And then you may say, wait a second, I've read a paper. I haven't read the paper, but I've read the abstract. Let's grab it now and read the paper because we may be able to use this. So long story short, I think you want people to read your papers and to not be pulled off by the title because you never know um, who will read it and what the scientific outcome would be if you guys would collaborate. And science is multidisciplinary, right? We are, we're, not, we're now at the stage where, where so many researchers are collaborating from different fields who would have never collaborated 20 years ago. And I think it's important that we write it this way. Thank you very much. All right. In the time we've been talking, we've had loads more questions in. So thanks so much, everyone, for um, for writing in your questions. Um, quite a few people are asking after review articles, Christine, and I wonder if you could um, share your thoughts on review articles. It, it, does, does what you just spoke about there generally apply to review articles or any other things you should bear in mind? So, uh, yes, thank you. Of course, I'm, I'm a Nature Reviews editor, so I'm very happy about this question. Um, so at, 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 Nature, at Nature Reviews, most of our articles, reviews are commissioned. So we, the editorial team, think about what are the big topics in the field, who would we want to write about it, and then we ask the authors. Having said that, I'm always happy about proposals. So if you have a good idea and you think you are the right person to write it right now, please, anytime, submit it or drop me an email. I'm always happy to look at that. And so are all the other reviews, editors, of course. For reviews, I think a review should not just be sort of a summary of the field, citing 500 references that have been published over the last two years, a review should be um, sort of authoritative account of the field. 
So yes, of course, you want to cite the key papers and you want to have recent papers, but you also want to uh, write a review about something where you want people right now to think about it. Maybe step back, maybe put some open questions out there, maybe summarize something that's difficult to understand. Um, speaking of vaccines, for example, again, I've I've been reading quite a quite a lot of reviews about this now because it's obviously very relevant. And I was like, I just don't understand it really. So I can't often not really dig into the primary re, uh, literature. But if there is a good review that explains to me what's actually, what has actually been done over the last two years, um, that's the kind of re review we're, we're looking at. And I think in reviews, it's also very important to create really good figures. So to not just replicate and copy and paste from papers, but to really think about nice, great schematics that would explain something that is difficult to write, maybe otherwise. Um, so yeah, I think reviews are incredibly important. And um, uh, if you have some, if, if you know of something where you feel like, oh, I, I don't think there is a good review out there, please, anytime, get in touch with us. Thanks so much. All right. There's an ab ab um, advertisement. All right. Um, we've got another question here from someone, um, which is quite an interesting question. Um, since undergraduate, this person writes, we've been taught how to write nature style essays or papers, but do you think this kind of education limits and constrains how people present their work? So the question is, I suppose, is there any one single way that's the best right way to write papers? Um, I don't think so. First of all, I think it depends um, It depends on your area. For example, a clinical paper that reports a clinical study will have to be written in a different way than a very fundamentally science pa fundamental science paper or a more applied paper. However, I do think that there are certain um, sort of guidelines um, that, that everybody can use to make a, a paper a bit more accessible. Whether I would call it the nature style, I don't know. Um, but I think a few of the things I touched uh, on, I touched upon today, there is valid for every every kind of writing, even for your thesis or or or, or other things that you may write that is not necessarily a paper. For example, that you write it clear, that you that you avoid ambiguity, that you that you are write it in a that you write the correct way, that you focused. I mean, these sort of things. I think apply to every paper. Um, at the end of the day, you want people to read it. Um, so you need to keep your readers in mind. You don't want to write a paper to tick a box on your CV. You want to write a paper because you want people to read your research. You've been putting probably many years of effort into this paper. So at the end of the day, it would be sad if you write it and then nobody reads it. And that really doesn't even depend where you publish it. I mean, we all know there are many, many, big stories that are really not have, that have not been published in nature at all. Um, so it doesn't matter where you publish it, but it does matter, I think, how clearly you are able to convey your message. So I think I would go with that, yeah. Thank you. So yeah, to summarize, there's, there's good writing rules for writing anything, right? But, um, uh, but but some things are more, more specific. Excellent, thank you. I've got a couple of quick questions around titles, if that's all right, Christine. Um, mm -hmm. I'll ask them together. First of all, is there a word number range for title? So how many, do you have any kind of rule of thumb for how many words should be in a title? And second, uh, do you ever advise uh, using a question in a title? Thank, um, you. thank you, thanks a lot. Um, so regarding the word limit, that depends on the journal. There are word limits, so it's always good anyways, before you start writing, to quickly look up the guidelines of this specific journal. You can always find that on the journal websites. So look at the guidelines. Um, there are limits. Sometimes they're not as strict. For, for, for example, for Nature Reviews materials, I can tell you that, of course, we have a word limit, but is debatable. Sometimes we discuss with production and we get a few longer titles through if we think it's really important, but it's always good to check the guidelines to ensure um, if, if the, this specific journal has a, a word limit. Regarding questions, I mean, never say never, but I would go with rather do not use a question in a title, really because um, why would you pose a question if you have, I assume you pose a question because you have the answer in your manuscript. So why not give the answer right away? Um, 
it's true though that very often if there is a question title more people click on it like on twitter or something um but i think at the end of the day it's scientific it's scientific literature and we want to be you want to really you want to have your main result in your title promise me this is what people are going to be interested in it because they want to know ah okay look what they found great um exactly i, I think i understood that right so so what you're saying is someone shouldn't have a title that says is there a limit to a human lifespan if if you have an answer to that question already right yes great thank you very much okay um an awful lot of people are asking after your career christine or um working uh, at nature or spring of nature as an editor um do you have any advice for those people who, who are interested in working as an editor what sort of what, what should they pursue during their phd or post up uh, yeah, thanks for the question. I um, so I love being an editor. I've I've done this now for three years. I've done my PhD um, in Austria and in the US. Um, I had a beautiful joint project, which was amazing. And then I've done a pretty long postdoc, almost six years, um, at Imperial College in London, and then at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. And then I changed direction when this opportunity came up to join the Nature Reviews Materials team. Um, I think if you're interested in a career as an editor, um, the, the, the thing you can do is obviously write and read a lot. If you can write blogs, if you can get involved in peer reviewing, maybe through your PIs, um, if you can involve, get involved somehow in the entire publishing, scientific publishing thing, that's always good. Um, I haven't written much myself as a postdoc. I was very much like science, scientific nerd lab situation. Um, but I always loved reading papers. I loved it. And one of the reasons I sort of stepped away from academia in the end was because I, I wanted to to work a little bit more on the bigger picture, if that makes sense. So I've been working for many years on, on one protein. I love the protein, really I do, and I've published a bit on it. And and but I want I always like, oh, I'm interested in so many other things as well. And now as an editor, I can actually I work on so many different manuscripts. I, I go to different conferences from soft matter to immunology. I learn, I read a lot, and it's it's quite exciting. It's never it's never it never gets boring. I also wasn't the biggest fan of bench work, so I guess for me it was at the end <clears throat> a really good move. But if you can get involved in 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 anything related to publishing, not only writing papers, but reading, peer reviewing, um, writing a scientific blog, maybe um, things like that help you a lot. And um, also, you don't necessarily need a postdoc at all or a long postdoc. It helps. The more you've done yourself, of course, the, the better, the easier it is sometimes to assess work. But a PhD is perfectly fine, and and check it out on Nature Jobs. What what the openings? Not only in Nature, of course, but at Nature Jobs, what the openings are. And yeah, it's a it's a great career. I can tell you that. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm sure that's helpful to a lot of people. Thank you. Um, we've got time for maybe just one or two very quick questions um, in the next four to five minutes. Um, I quite like this question. Can you share any um, any of the most common mistakes people make when submitting to Nature? If there's anything sort of in common between papers. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, that's that's an interesting question actually. I mean, for reviews, I think most of the very often they are just incredibly long, <laughs> and we have uh, we usually try to keep it short and sweet to. To about seven, eight thousand words. It's sometimes very, very long, and very often it's not clear to me in the cover letter at all. Why do you want to write this now? Why do you think this is now um, a time to write it? Um, so I, I always love cover letters for reviews where the authors tell me, "Look, we want to write this now because these were the key things that came out in the last half year. This is where the field is going." So give me a bit of background information. It saves me a bit of time as well. And for primary research papers. Um, I don't think, it, I'm not sure if there are any sort of common mistakes. As I said, usually we really read every paper anyways, including the supplementary information, because I always try really to filter, and every editor does that, try to filter the actual science. Um, the thing that sometimes I think is difficult if it's not clear, I think I mentioned this in the talk, I had quite a few papers where I spent many hours on it, and in the end I still didn't really know so what 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 exactly was the experiment? For example, in my area, 
what exactly is your animal model? What exactly, how did you inject it? How often? If it wasn't, if it's not clear from the figures or from the text, this could be something, again, we always try to filter the science, but this could be a reason to, to probably not go ahead with peer review, because if I don't understand that the peer reviewers would go like, why are you sending me this? I don't even know what it is. So I think it's really important to write it in a very clear, clear way so that people understand it. Probably I would say that, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just clicking through the last questions here. Um, we've got lots of kind of broad questions like how to get a paper published in Nature, um, which you know I, I hope the last hour has been helpful to that person. Um, uh, there's a question here. I had a put marks and I lost it. There it is. Do you have any um, specific advice for things to be less dense? So this person points out that nature papers tend to have lots and lots of um, appendices or supplements that have lots and lots of information in the back. Um, is that kind of a good technique, would you say, generally, to, to make papers less dense? Is to, is to kind of put... Uh, we're talking about CVs later, and I hope everyone tunes in, and we, we're going to say something similar in that talk as it happens, to, to make a kind of rough overview in the first two pages and then move additional information into appendices. But is that is that a strategy you'd recommend generally than handing in a draft for a paper? Um, so yeah, that, that's that's a very good question. Um, I think it is because you need it's tricky sometimes because you need to filter out what are the the main the data I really need to show in the actual paper and the to kind of support your conclusions. This data needs to be in the main paper. But yeah, these days, I mean, the, the, the projects, the experiments are very complex and you need all of your controls, you need all of the things you need to run and you don't want to put this all in the main paper because nobody, nobody will be able to digest all of it. So I think that's why we have this, sometimes I agree, rather massive supplementary information but I think when, when you prepare the figures, I think the data that supports the main findings, the, this data needs to be in the main paper as a figure and also discussed. And the other things can move to the supplementary information. Um, we did do, I mean, sometimes throughout the revision process, I'm sure many of you know that, uh, there's sometimes several rounds of, of, of revisions and then sometimes it gets more and more and more data. Um, and the data should be there and should be accessible to the readers. Um, but it ha otherwise our papers are going to be massive. And I mean, many of our journals are still printed and you would print a book every, every, every month rather than a journal. So it's tricky though sometimes, but for the main findings, data should be in the main paper. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, that's all we have time for today. So thank you so, so much, Christine, for joining us and for answering all those questions and giving such a superb talk. Um, thank you as well to everyone who asked questions. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, I'll be back in around an hour talking to Sarah Blackford around um, a CV review along with a question and answer session. So please do stick around if you're interested in improving your CV. And thanks so much for attending the event. Thank you again, Christine, for joining us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. We'll see you in a